In the age following the Persian Wars, the military victories of Simon expanded the Athenian Confederacy, incorporated tribute-paying allies, and facilitated Athenian colonization in the Aegean world, which gave Athens an impressive stream of revenue, and these new sources of wealth swelled the Athenian treasury. And under the administration of Pericles, which operated with little political opposition, Athenian largesse was funneled into the arts. Plutarch writes, that which gave most pleasure and ornament to the city of Athens, and the greatest admiration and even astonishment to all strangers, was his construction of the public and sacred buildings. And of Athenian artistic creations, Plutarch says, they were created in a short time for all time. Each one of them in its beauty was even then and at once antique. But in the freshness of its vigor, it is even to the present day recent and newly wrought, such is the bloom of perpetual newness, as it were, upon these works of his, which makes them ever to look untouched by time, as though the unfaltering breath of an ageless spirit has been infused into them. As we enter this remarkable period of history, we turn to the German scholar of the 18th century, Johann Joachim Winckelmann, of whom Goethe writes, Winkelmann was the reincarnation of ancient man, insofar as that may be said of anyone in our time. And in his great work, The History of the Art of Antiquity, published in 1764, Winkelmann described the unique attributes of Greek art and the cultural environment that nurtured it. He calls Greek art the most worthy subject for study and imitation. And Winkelmann writes of the Periclean period of history, from this time forward, all the powers in Greece seem to have been set in motion, and the greatest gifts of this nation began to manifest themselves more than ever. The extraordinary men and great minds that had been developing since the start of the great movement in Greece now emerged all at once. He continues, philosophy itself was first taught publicly in Athens at this time by Anaxagoras, who opened his school. And it was Socrates who was the first to consider the conduct of life, says Diogenes. And of this period, Winkelmann continues, Greeks in their prime were contemplative beings, and they exercised the mind when it was most fired up by the sprightliness of the body. Being learned in the sense of knowing what others have known was cultivated later. Excellence in every art and craft was especially valued, and the best makers of the most negligible things could render their names immortal. When Winkelmann describes Greek culture in these lines, he is not just writing in over-lavish praise so that his readers will content themselves with mere admiration of ancient Greece. He wants to inspire us to imitate them by implying that Greek art was not just a beautific ornament to civilization, but that it was a byproduct of a superior political, cultural, and educational environment that would do us good to recreate beyond the statues and columns. And it is clear that Winkelmann thought about this when he reminds us, the youthful intellect, like a tender bark, retains and enlarges an impression. These are important lines that the individual is impressed upon by their surroundings and by those with whom they converse, such that their language and their thinking is formed by way of association. And so it must be the case that both excellence and mediocrity are alike contagious. And in ancient Greece, Winkelmann is telling us, excellence is what prevailed. And he writes, the way of thinking of an entire people sprang up like a fine branch from a healthy trunk. And he continues, In those days was laid a foundation for the greatness of Greece, on which a splendid and lasting edifice could be erected. The philosophers and poets were the first to put their hands to the task, the artists completed it, and history leads us to it through a splendid portal. So what were these traits that were transmitted from philosopher to poet and from poet to artist? Socrates tells us the role of philosophy in Plato's Phaedo, that philosophy, taking possession of the soul, encourages it gently, exhorting it to collect and concentrate itself within itself, and to trust nothing except itself. And Socrates continues to say of the philosopher, his soul believes that it must gain peace from emotions, must follow reason, 
and abide always in it, beholding that which is true and divine and not a matter of opinion. Socrates is very brilliant to associate emotional tranquility with an indifference to opinions. And on no topic is opinion a greater cause of tension than in a discussion of what is right and good. Any such discussion that gets too specific is a waste of time, according to Aristotle. He writes, To assert the existence of a form, not only of good, but of anything else, is a mere idle abstraction. Now, the word which is translated as form is ideon, the root of our word for idea, although it is not identical in meaning, according to the footnote. But what I think Aristotle is saying is that there's no such thing as an ideological opinion which to hold it makes you good. In ancient Greece, if you were a student and your mind was still forming, you were not compelled to listen to somebody else assert what their idea of good is. And that liberated their minds to think for themselves, and that is what unleashed their intellectual potential. Winkelmann seems to be saying something a lot like this when he writes, The youthful intellect was not diverted by mere sounds devoid of concepts, and the brain was not already filled up with dreams when truth wanted to take its place. And when Winkelmann says dreams there, I think he means an idle abstraction, like Aristotle was saying. And back to what Plato quotes Socrates as saying, When the soul inquires alone, by itself, it departs into the realm of the pure, the everlasting, the immortal, and the changeless. And this state of the soul is called wisdom. The two crucial words there being unchanging and everlasting. And in agreeing with this, Aristotle writes something worth noting for the artists. Beauty is present even more in the unchanging. For all these admitted goods consist in order and rest. So having read this, looking at Winkelmann, he says something very similar. Stillness is the state most proper to beauty. And experience shows that the most beautiful beings are of a still and well-mannered nature. And with these lines, we should look at the charioteer of Delphi. Now, Winkelmann could not have seen this work because it was excavated after his death. And yet it shows that his intuition as to the Greek artistic ideal was correct. And if we look at this sculpture and read Winkelmann, he writes, The hand of the artist produced physiques that were purged of human need, figures that represent humanity in a higher state of worthiness. A tenet of the high style was to represent the face and attitude of the deities and heroes freed from emotion and removed from inner agitation in an equilibrium of feeling and with a peaceful and always equable soul. We are meant to see the loftiness of philosophy written across the face of the charioteer. As Jean Charbonneau writes, Before the charioteer of Delphi, one cannot but feel the presence of genius. The charioteer has no obvious opinions. The work of art has no politics, no social agenda. It presents a state of being, an essential essence. And in the image of Apollo, we see yet another sculpture, which Winkelmann would say, approaches the blissful stillness of divine nature, which the great artists, as the ancients wrote, sought to capture in an image. And the divine image is always in human form. As Michael Siebler tells us, it was the opinion of the artist Polycletus that an artistically successful representation of a human being could also contain moral values. And why did the Greeks believe this worked so well, in addition to the reasons we've already been discussing? Greek art did something that philosophy cannot do. Philosophy cannot define virtue. The definition of virtue is left basically open-ended, especially in Mino, Plato's Mino, and most of the Socratic dialogues. And so what Greek art did is it said, well, we may not know what virtue is, but this is how it acts. This is what it looks like. This is the tranquil face of goodness. It is as Socrates says in Xenophon's Memorabilia 3, the sculptor must represent in his figures the activities of the soul. 